from ending a day depressed. We say depressed from pressed under, bent, and we stoop at the sound of its voice, like an old woman reciting the same menu for the thousandth time. I'll be awake all night, counting sheep, reading, repeating psalms and old song lyrics, praying, like the stops on a cathedral organ being pushed in slowly, loving my own grief, my own voice. The cover of Years That Answer emphasizes, right under the title, poems. Yet, if you look at the print layout, some of the pages, in fact, many of the pages look like prose. How do you explain that? About, I guess about a third of the poems in, that, in the larger book, Years That Answer, are prose poems, which is a particular poetic uh, device that was developed primarily in 19th century France. And it, it's, I could deliver a whole dissertation on the prose poem, which I won't do, but it is, it's like a sonnet. It's a form of poetry that a lot of people were writing in the 60s, and most of those were written, those of mine that are in that book, were written in the late 60s, early 70s. So they're fairly old poems. Could you read your shortest poem? I could say my shortest poem. Uh, it's called Love Poem. A deaf man talks to himself, a wild flurry of hands. What makes one sentence a poem? I think, in that particular case anyway, if you have a, a highly concentrated language and you're not trying necessarily to do anything more ambitious than to define a condition, make a little joke, um, startle people, in a way, it's acceptable to have one line as a poem. Probably there could be a one-word poem. I'm sure there have been one-word poems. Uh, that's the only time I've ever written a one-line poem, and it will probably be the only time <laughs> I'll ever write a one-line poem. It was sort of a little joke that I was playing uh, with myself. Everybody writes love poems, and a lot of poets write primarily love poems. And I thought, well, I'm a poet. I'll write a love poem. So it's sort of a, a joke on that whole tradition of, of long, elaborate, involved love poems. You use hands in that particular poem, and in many of your poems, you use the motif of hands. Why? Um, I, I think uh, that in many ways, what we need to be doing as people is connecting more than we have been in the past. I think our society is becoming more interdependent. Uh, I don't want to give a whole political response, but I do think that if I have anything to say to people, it is that, that we could probably serve each other by holding hands a little bit more. And I suppose that's why the realist, I mean that metaphorically more than literally, although literally too. So often the hands seem disturbed, ringing or, or flying around. Yeah. That's true. I, I suppose for me it becomes a strong metaphor. They're not always, they are connected to, uh, particularly in the poems in the book that concern Eskimo art. There's a lot of connection, a lot of hands being held or touching or connecting. How did you arrive at that group of poems? How did you become familiar with that group of prints? Uh, I found them actually. I found them in the basement area of Toronto in Toronto, Canada, and I was just absolutely taken with those prints. Uh, in, in a way, I've never really had that intense a response to, to any particular work of art before. It was almost as if I had made those prints myself in another life. It was really a very I intense response. So I, I bought a book of them and brought them back home with me and studied them over a period of time and began to write some poems out of them. A lot of poets do that, and for me it just happened to be these Eskimo prints. There's a lot of poets who write poems to Van Gogh or Cezanne or whoever, but I just found these Eskimo prints. I was really attracted to them. They're very primitive kind of prints. Most of them are done by women and concern everyday tasks, everyday life among the Eskimos. What do you find as the major sources for your poetry? Uh, art to some extent. Music. Music is very important to me. I think probably any, any artist uh, responds a lot to other art forms, and I certainly do. Uh, music, art, dancing, 
There are several dancing poems in that book. Uh, I think there is that kind of connection. My own life, the events of my own life, my dogs, what happens in my family, all the things I suppose one would, would think of. It's nothing very elaborate. Uh, my life. What are you working on now? Another collection of poems and a long poem, an epic poem. I am uh, working on, in addition to another book of poems, a collection of my thoughts about the teaching of poetry. So I guess that's sort of, uh, it's, it'll, it will be a prose work, not, uh, not poetry. I've had a lot of different varied teaching experiences, and I want to write something of what those experiences have in common and in what ways they are different. As a teacher and a poet, what do you most want to share with your students, whether they be little children or senior citizens or somewhere in between, when it comes to writing? Well, it depends, you know, different things on different days. Um, I suppose something kind of contradictory in a way, uh, poetry is a lot of work and it's a lot of fun. And I, I think both of those are important for people to understand. I guess I would like people to get some understanding of the ways in which you have to suspend your conscious, rational mind to engage in, in an act of writing poetry at all, to, to let it go, to, to be free with your thoughts, to become a little child again, uh, to have a good time, to play. In addition, I would want to convey to people the fact that you also have to think, and you have to make some choices, and that's a rational process. And there's some work involved, a lot of reading involved, a lot of thinking involved. And it's sort of like a three-part process. To decide you're going to write a poem at all, you have to be a little bit crazy, a little bit childlike, a little bit willing to suspend belief. Uh, and then when you get in the middle of it, you have to think, and you have to make choices and move words around in a rational way. And then at the last moment, when the poem's coming together, you have to once again be crazy. Uh, and not be, not be rational, not be, uh, not think. Maggie, of all the poems in Years That Answer, which is your favorite? The last one, because it's the most recent one. And because, personally, for me, it says most of what I wanted to be saying in that book. Body and Soul. I have waited for this storm as if for the one great love of my life and meet it now knowing I have always been ready. Ripe to be licked by wind, I give it my own white back like the leaves, toss in my mind as the fireflies circle. My arms edge toward it in twilight with the tenderness I've sought for years. My fingers slide familiar over thin notes as if remembered. Yes, this was how it would be all the houses and the sheds would pall. The air would fill and the sky yellow before the breaking loose with it at last. Just as my own precise rhythms now rest one beat, then syncopate. Just as that solid breath now blows straight from the sacks of the rain. Mm -hmm.